important. Without connectivity, our world would not be what it is today. We're going to make a biblical application to this thought and this concept. And in our scripture reading, we looked at Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2, where we read, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. These verses were written to God's people at that time. And I believe these words are applicable also for us today. What it says is arise. What does that denote? It denotes that God's people were not standing up. They were either laying down or sitting down. They were not in an arising position. And there's also contrasted in these verses, light and darkness. Two contrasting things are, are brought forth in this verse. For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen. And what is going to be the condition? Darkness. Do we see that in our world today? We live in a world of darkness. God is calling his people to do what? Arise and shine. It ends by saying, the Lord shall arise upon thee, and whose glory? His glory shall be seen upon thee. This is my hope and desire for each and every one of you. You are God's people. To arise and shine in 2019. That the glory of the Lord may arise upon you, or may rest upon you, and that light Whose light? His light, the Lord's light, may shine through you to others. I hope that this is your desire also for 2019. The Bible says in John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, Who is the light of the world? I am the light of the world. Who's speaking? Jesus. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. The title of our subject this morning is Beholding the Connectivity Challenge. You know, connectivity is really what makes this world and this modern age go round. Without connectivity, we would not be the world we are today. It would be a totally different world. All of the information, all of the knowledge, all of the technology, all of science, all of those things, even education, is, is based on connectivity. Without connectivity, there is a disconnect, and there would not be the information flow that we have in our world today. I'm going to use the word connectivity and relationship somewhat interchangeably for the purpose not of definition accuracy, but for the purpose of communicating the concept. Connectivity and relationship. Now, by definition, connectivity is to be connected, interconnected, or conducting. A beautiful Bible verse that describes that is found in your Bibles, John 15 verse 5 where it says I am the light of the world but in John 15 5 it says I am the vine ye are the branches he that abideth abideth is the connectivity component in me and I in him relationship component the same does what brings forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing. Without connectivity in this world, science and technology can do nothing. Without connectivity in the universe with Jesus, with heaven, we are fruitless. We can do nothing. So my message to you this morning is, for 2019, it's my hope and desire that you are connected. 
that you be connected, that you have connectivity with heaven, with a higher power, with a server. You see, in connectivity, sometimes you have a server and then you have uh, uh, remote units, right? Some kind of remote units, you know, like we have here, different devices. And when there is no connectivity, there is no communication. There is no transfer of information. Nothing happens. So for 2019, my hope and desire is that connectivity be the thing that you experience and you benefit from. Here's a little illustration that I, you know, just found as a picture to try to show connectivity. You see, when we have connectivity, we have something here, we have something here, but there needs to be a connection. There may, there may need to be some hardware. There may need to be a program written for connectivity to exist. Take programs to talk to each other. There needs to be sometimes some software, some program written. And this picture here tries to depict that. There's your hardware. And at some point, there is some software that makes that possible so that there can be communication from here to here, connectivity. Now, in the scheme of the universe, a separation took place in the Garden of Eden. And connectivity was broken, shall we say. But we see here, connectivity is found how? And through whom? And by what? We see connectivity through Jesus Christ and the cross. God has provided what way? The only way. Now the choice is yours. What are you going to choose for 2019? Is there going to be a state of disconnect? Maybe a state of reconnect? Or maybe you're going to have free-flowing connectivity between you and heaven. I hope and pray that after your stu this study today, you will be convinced and convicted of the importance of spiritual Christian connectivity. The connectivity program is... The plan of salvation. You see, some software had to be written to reestablish a connection. And I would like to suggest to you this morning that the software that is written to facilitate connectivity between you and heaven is called, what is it called? The plan of salvation. That plan makes it possible. Makes it possible, makes it feasible, and makes it a reality. We read in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we're going to spend a little time on this Bible text. This is our central theme for our study this morning. And, and we're going to, to look at this in a little bit of detail and approach it from different angles. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Because a principle is brought forth here. A principle that was from the beginning. Throughout time. I'd like to suggest this principle even existed before the fall. Amen. Look what it says here. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. An interesting Bible text that shows forth a principle that needs to be understood for each and every one of us. Now, what does it say here in the beginning? With open face. In your Bibles, if you look just a few verses up, maybe to verse 13, you will see that when Moses, he came down from the mountain, what did he have? Did he have an open face? He veiled himself. He had to veil himself because the glory of the Lord was shining so strongly through his face. The people could not, could not bear to see him. So what did he do? He had to veil his face. But here in verse 18, we read that with open face, open face. See, there's something that separates us, that veils us from the presence of God. 
And I'd like to suggest that sin is that veil that separates, that causes a, 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 a veiling to take place. Beholding as in a glass. Now, back in the day, the only way someone could see themselves is to highly polish some brass or some silver and then use that to look into. That's the only way you could behold. That was the only way you could, you could see how you really look like. So, in, in that uh, context, there is reflection taking place. Huh? Another uh, Bible commentator or translation talks about not so much beholding, but reflecting as in a glass. See, when you look into that, you see the reflection of your image. And then it talks about being changed into the same image from glory to glory. Now, when you look into a mirror and you point it to yourself, what do you see? You see your own face. But there's a wonderful metaphor here portrayed in that verse. When you turn that mirror to the sun, and then what happens when you look into that mirror? You don't see yourself anymore. You don't see yourself anymore. Why? Because the reflection of the sun is so powerful that when you look into that mirror, what do you see? All you see is the sun. Beholding as in a glass. The glory of the Lord, what will you see? When you look into that mirror and you see the glory of the Lord, are you going to see yourself? You will only see God. You will only see that. When you direct it in the direction of the light of his glory, self is lost sight of. And only God is seen. And then this beautiful principle takes place. Change. Change into what? Into the same image. It's like when you look into that mirror that's pointed to the sun, all you see is the sun. And that's all that there is. A wonderful Bible principle. Transformed, transferred from glory to glory. He will transform you into the likeness. You do the beholding. He does the transforming. You do the beholding and he does the transforming. You see, character is a reflection of what you are looking at. Character is a reflection of what you are looking at. We're told, and I think it was in our Sabbath school lesson this last quarter, that Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, in their perfect state, were created in the, help me, likeness of God, right? And we read that they were going to become more and more like God in character as time went on. Remember that thought? That was a beautiful thought in our lesson. So after a hundred years, had they not fallen, they would have been more like God. After a thousand years, more, as time passed, become more and more like Him. See, that principle existed before. That principle is still true today, except we lost his image, and there's a lot of likeness that needs to be changed today. But that principle is still true. Beholding causes us to change. And it was connectivity with the Creator in the Garden of Eden that would have led to that change. Man communicated with God. There was a relationship, connectivity there. The Christian battle is a battle of connection. Oh, friends, that is going to be my battle in 2019. A battle of connection. Because when connectivity is there and it's established, the principle of beholding and becoming changed is automatic. It's a fact. It takes place. It's a reality. It's an experience. You see, and, and this is when it will be completed. When Christ comes in the clouds of heaven, this principle, I would like to suggest to you, culminates in its completion. For we read in 1 John 3, 2, 
Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, when he shall appear, what does it say? We shall be what? We shall be like him. Why? For we shall see him, what does it say? As he is. As he is. See, when he comes in the clouds of heaven, we've never seen him that way. When he comes in the clouds of heaven, he's going to come in all his glory and majesty, and we're going to really see him how he is. And then the final culmination of likeness will take place, and what will happen? We're going to be transformed. No more, no more sickness, no more death, all of the wrinkles, all of the disease, all of the things will remain in the grave, and those that are alive will be caught up, and we're going to be just like him. See, that principle of beholding culminates in that final look. If I might use that as a metaphor, to depict the final change that will take place. And it is a connectivity or relationship issue. That's what it is. You are transformed by beholding, not by working. You're transformed by beholding. What did I say? Character is a reflection of what you're looking at. Who you are is what you are beholding. Beholding is becoming. Oh, it's my hope and prayer. That in 2019, you are becoming more like Jesus. The question is, what are you beholding? Whatever you're beholding is what you're going to become more like in 2019. And if you don't like what you are and you want to become something else, behold the perfect, the perfect Jesus Christ. If I might use the eye here, just as a little example. And again, I'm using this metaphorically. It is not to be taken literally. But it's for the purpose of understanding a little bit the concept of change. Because it occurs even in vision. You see something. It comes back into the eye. And you know what? There it is. It's not as big. It's a little smaller, but it's there. It's in your eye. It's part of what you are and what you're seeing there. And then what you see, then it goes through here. The optic nerve, the optic tract. And then there are areas in the brain, a few areas. You've got the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and you have the lateral uh, geniculate uh, nucleus over here. And, and those two things are relay areas. They relay what you see to a little bit, you know, say, well, this needs to go here, and this needs to go here, and this is where we need to network it. And then, you know, the visual cortex right here. Then this information goes there, and there is a change that takes place as a consequence of what you saw. Something happens there in your brain. We become what we contemplate, says Plato. Even Plato, even the science, even the world knows this principle. We become what we contemplate. This is something I have experienced. I don't know if you've done this before. This is a little bit of an experience. You know, if you sometimes get up in the morning and you don't feel, okay, the way you want to feel, what do you need to do? And this works. This works. You change how you think. And when you change how you think, all of a sudden you will change how you feel. You will change how you feel. I may get up in the morning and I just may not, uh, I don't feel like doing anything. Right? I start thinking about doing something. Pretty soon I feel like doing something. this beholding just happen? Or does it just happen? Yeah, in one sense it, it is. It is the gift of grace. God made us this way. There, there is this principle from creation. Uh, this beholding principle. It's God's gift. Gift of grace. Uh, but the, uh, on the other hand, the beholding principle also involves purposeful effort. It's a gift, but requires also purposeful effort. Some Bible text to support that. Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. There is 
is some purposeful effort in this Bible text. Joshua 24, 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Purposeful effort. Powerful Bible text. Taken from the book that I may know him. It is a fatal mistake to think there's nothing for you to do to obtain salvation. You are to, and I've highlighted some words that are important that they may sink in. Cooperate with the agencies of heaven. There is a cross to be lifted. There is a wall to be scaled. There is a ladder to be climbed before the gate of the pearl is reached. And as you realize, and I want us to repeat this, these words in our minds, because I'm going to read it a couple of times. You realize the inability, weakness, and cry for help. This is beautiful. A divine voice will come to who? To you. From where? From the battlements of heaven. Say, take hold of my strength. This is such a beautiful thought. This, this portrays the power that lies within the connectivity with heaven. What it can actually do. Let me, let me repeat this part again, just to re-emphasize. Yeah, there's a lot of things that need to happen. There's a lot of things that need to happen. But the most important thing that needs to happen is you need to realize what? Two things. Inability. Number one. Number two. What does that mean, inability? You don't have the know-how. You don't have the capacity. You don't have... And number two, you don't have the strength. Weakness. And when you realize that, you need to do something. What do you need to do? Cry. Cry. Cry to who? Cry for help. And when you do that, there is a beautiful promise. The promise says, a divine voice will. A divine voice will come. And what will it tell you to do? Establish connectivity. Be connected. Be connected. And receive, if you will, I'm paraphrasing now, strength from somewhere else. Oh, Frank, it's my hope and desire that this principle might be your driving force for you in 2019. Since we can be saved only through the grace of God, which is a free gift, why is it that man will, to his own hurt, lift himself up in pride and take glory unto himself? Jumping down. The divine favor of the grace of God bestowed upon us through Jesus Christ is too precious to be given in exchange for any supposed meritorious work on the part of finite, erring man. Man has, what are those highlighted words again? Nothing in himself. Man has nothing. You have nothing that you can bring into what we now have as 2019 to make this a successful, prosperous year for Jesus Christ. You have nothing in yourself that can make you more like him. But when you realize this and cry, divine help will come. What does this reference say? Man can accomplish how much? Nothing good without God. Nothing good with God without God. All that is of value, I'm skipping a little bit because these, these references are a little bit long. All that is of value comes from who? comes from God. And belongs to who? Belongs to God. There is a reason that the agents of the enemy sometimes display remarkable wisdom. I want to underscore this. You know, 
There is sometimes remarkable wisdom that comes from where? From the devil. Let's read on and find out why. Satan himself was educated and disciplined in the courts. The courts of what? In the courts of heaven. He was schooled there. He was disciplined there. He was educated there. I don't know for how long, but I know one thing. His education and his discipline surpasses anything that I have or any other human has. And he has a knowledge, and I blew this word up. Because this principle is, I think, forgotten and not fully understood. He has a knowledge of, what is that word? Of good. Why does he have a knowledge of good? Because he was educated in heaven. And it goes on to say, as well as of evil. He has a knowledge of good. There's where the danger lies. The danger lies not in the evil, I would like to submit to you, but in the good that he knows. And what does he do in the next sentence? It says, he mingles. He mingles what? The good and the evil. He mingles, how it says here, the precious with the vile. And this is what gives him power of deceiving the sons of men. The next sentence says, because he has stolen the livery of heaven in order that he may exercise an influence in his usurped dominion. Oh friend, the only way, the only way, and it's not because I'm saying it, it's because the Bible says it and inspiration says it. That 2019 can be a victorious year, a successful year, is connectivity with heaven. The devil knows too much. He's been educated at a place that you and I have never been. He knows good. And he will display good. But then he will mingle it with evil. Precious with vile. And that's where your danger and man, my danger lies. I see good in what he says and what he does. There's a lot of good out there. But the only good, the only good friend can come to you with a connection with heaven. That's the only source where you can rely on having really a true connection with the good. See, religious services, prayers, confession, praises, all these things are good things. You know this reference from Selected Messages. All of these good things, they go up to heaven. And where did we read all good comes from? What's the source of all good? God. Well, these things, all these good things, prayers, services, they all go up to heaven. But what happens? They go through corrupt channels. Who are those? You and me, these good things. And when they go through these corrupt channels, what happens? The good becomes defiled. The very good that you and I do, the praying, the praising, the whatever it is, becomes defiled. And something needs to take place, as you can read here. They ascend, but they have to be purified by his righteousness. Otherwise, it is, what does it say here? Not acceptable to God. See, you need connectivity to transfer even the good. And then something else has to happen. It has to be purified by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And something needs to be added to it. All incense from earthly tabernacles must be moistened with the cleansing drops of the blood of Christ. He holds before the Father the censer of his own merits, in which there is no taint of earthly pollution. Oh, friend, even the good you do is not acceptable to God. All good comes from God. Good expressed by man 
requires purification. We are to do all that we can do on our part to fight the good fight of faith. We are to wrestle, to labor, to strive, to agonize, to endure for the straight thing. We are to set the Lord ever before us with clean hands and pure hearts. We are to seek to honor God in all his ways. Help has been provided for us in, who, in him who is mighty to save. The spirit of truth and life will quicken and renew by its mysterious working. For all our spiritual improvement comes from God and not ourselves. The true worker will have what? Divine power, but the idler will not be sustained. The true worker will have what? Power. Divine power. But the idler will not be sustained. This is speaking about God's people. This was written in uh, 1882. I am filled with sadness when I think of our condition as a people. The Lord has not closed heaven to us, but our course of continual backsliding has separated us from God. Pride, covetousness, and the love of the world have lived in the hearts without fear of banishment or, or condemnation. Grievous and presumptuous sins dwell among us. The church has turned back from following Christ her leader as a, and is steadily doing what? Retreating to Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power. Doubt and even unbelief of the testimony of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches everywhere. Satan would have it thus. The testimonies are unread and unappreciated. God has spoken to you. Light has been shining from his word and from the testimonies. Both have been slighted and disregarded. The results is apparent. Is apparent. A lack of purity and devotion and earnest faith among us. We have not brought our, upon our, have we not brought upon ourselves the frown of God? Because our actions do not correspond to our faith. Our actions do not correspond to our faith. Have we not been seeking the friendship and the applause of the world rather than the presence of Christ and a deeper knowledge of his will? The red word says, Examine. Examine your own heart. Choose your own course. Consider what associates are you choosing. Oh, you know what? I, I remember when I was young, my dad would always say to me, you know, choose your friends carefully. Sometimes he would say, you know, this person may not be really a good friend for you. Why, dad? Because... Who you associate with, who your friends are, that's who you are. You would say that often to me. Who your friends are really, really determine who you are. I think we should examine ourselves here in our hearts. Judge our course. Consider what associates are you choosing. What am I choosing? Who are we affiliating? ourselves with. Because what we affiliate ourselves with, that is who we become. Who we are connecting with. Who we are connected with. That is what determines what we are like. You know, I, I remember also Dad would talk about, well, you know, <clears throat> you can really know who somebody is if you just look at their checkbook. Yeah, back in that day, that was true. Give me your checkbook and let me go through your checkbook and, and your daytime planner, your day planner. What your life is all about, you know, how you spend your time and, and how you spend your money. But today we could say, in 2019, show me your credit card statement. What would you think if you, if you brought in your credit card statement and passed it around the church next week? 
Everybody print out their credit card statements and pass it around in the church. Would that be a little bit of a reflection on the spending of your money? How comfortable would you say, oh, you said it's private. Well, that's why the verse says, examine your own selves. Maybe if you don't want to bring it to church next week and pass around the credit card statements, maybe you want to print it out for yourself to look at. And see how you are connecting. Now, another thing. Oh, how many people brought their cell phones today? Do you have your cell phone today? Yes. You have your cell phone. How many have iPhones? How many have cell phones? Raise your hands. I know you have cell phones. Do you have an iPhone? How many have iPhones here today? Do you have iPhones? Let us, let us look at how we're using our iPhones. Because our devices show how we're using our time. So open up your cell phones for a moment. I know you've been all in the Bible verses, looking at your Bible verses. You can go out of that application for a moment, and you can go now to settings. Okay? Press settings, scroll down to battery. Wait for a moment, battery will open up. And what's it going to show there? Now go ahead, are you there? Now, go not to the last 24 hours, but push in the last 10 days. In settings, last 10 days. There it will show the battery usage for the last 10 days. It will do it all real nicely by all of the applications you have there. Now, if you want to know it in terms of time, just there on your right side, right next to battery usage, it says show activity. Push on activity, and there will you see the application exactly in hours of how much time you spent on your device. Connectivity, right? This is connectivity. Scroll there, and what do you see? You don't have to tell me. What do you see at the top of where you spent your time? Scroll down, and you will see it all in order. Now, would you like to pass your phone around, take a screenshot of that, and pass it around the church so we can all see how you've been spending your time on your devices? What is on the top of your devices? Is it Facebook? What is it? Maybe it's Google. Ask Google. Oh, friends, we got to stop asking Google. we got to start using this, this. This application, this application beats the Google application. Ask the Bible what it says. You want direction for your life? You don't have to ask GPS. I'm suggesting to you, and I'm speaking metaphorically now, GPS will lead you to hell. Why will it do that? Because the devil mixes good with evil. If you want to know direction to heaven, Use this application, and this application has in it something that is called Divine Navigation System, DNS. Put that app in your, in, your, uh, in your mind through the connectivity of the beholding concept, and you're going to find the direction to heaven. Now you're still in here, aren't you? You're looking at all of the things that you did the last 10 days. Now I can share with you, in my application here, I'll make a confession. The Bible is not on the top. It's not on the top here. Now I am up close, you know, in my rankings, Bible and Spirit Prophecy, it's because I prepared my sermon on my cell phone. Okay. So I spent quite a bit of, you know, I spent a little bit of time getting these things together, and I don't use the computer only for the presentation. I did it on my cell phone. And so because I use the cell phone on the, this week, it's up ranking high. But maybe if I was doing things, you know, other weeks, what would my ranking be? Huh? Ellen White writings? Weather, weather, ah, all of these things. Examine yourselves, brothers and sisters. 2019 is a connectivity issue. I said the battle is the battle of connectivity.
captivity. That's where the battle is at. Moving on. Our only safety is found in obedience to God's word, which has given us a sure God. And consider God's people today. They are to keep themselves distinct and separate from the world. I'd like to, again, metaphorically rephrase that. Deconnect from the world and connect to Jesus. Have connectivity there. Distinct and separate. You cannot be plugged into two things. These are not parallel screens where you can run multiple apps on the same thing. This is not how you work. You're either connected with the one or connected with the other. That's the only way it can work. That's how we have been made. It is the duty. Oh, friends, what does this say? This was written in 1861. One year after Adventism picked a name. SDA. That name was agreed upon by believers in 1860. They were organized in 63. So this was before that. It is the duty of every child to inquire, wherein am I separate from the world? Connectivity. I did a spirit of prophecy search on this separate thing, and we're going to terminate our sermon here, even though I have much more material, and I'll share it with you and continue at some other time. There are 189 hits in the Ellen White apps that deal with separate from the world. I took the time, and that's why I had so many hours on my cell phone, and so I had a good ranking in the last 10 days. That's the only reason. And read all 189 of them. I wanted to know every reference what Ellen White said about separate from the world. In which context, what's above it, what's below it, and what's it about? And I can tell you it ranges from everything about what you think to what you eat. And everything in between. Do a search and read it for yourself. And see what it means. It is your duty. The Review and Herald, June 26, 1861. The same reference says, the same injunction rests upon God's people now to be separate from the world as rested upon ancient Israel. We think we live in a different time. Yes, we do. But the God is the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has a connectivity requirement to only be plugged into Him. And if you're not plugged into Him, you're disconnected. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no no other gods. He doesn't tolerate connectivity with all kinds of things. It's him or nothing. And if you're not connected with him, you have no sure information database. The server is the devil who has good, bad, and indifferent. And that's what you'll get. And what you behold is what you will become. I'm going to end just with this final statement because it's something beautiful to think about. Because sometimes the commandments of God have a negative flavor in our mouths. We don't like commandments. We like the love of Jesus and things like that. I found this beautiful statement about God's commandments which I think should inspire you. It says, the great head of the church who has chosen his people out of the weak world requires them to be separate from the world, and he designs that the spirit of his commandments, by drawing his followers to himself, shall separate them from the worldly elements. This is a beautiful thought. What draws them? The spirit, not the letter, the spirit of his commandments. Now I understand David so much better. David was the friend of God, wasn't he? God and David had a special relationship. If you read in the Bible, the biggest chapter in the Bible, in the entire Bible is what? 
Psalms 119. And it has how many verses? 76 verses. And what are they all about? 176 verses all about the law. And I was thinking, wow, what a relationship. He knew the spirit of the law. He knew the spirit of the law. This comment in the spirit of prophecy occurs only six times. You might want to look it up and see it in all of its setting. In all of its setting, it has the same sentence, just a little above and a little below. But it is beautiful. And when you understand the spirit of God's law, it will draw you. I challenge you in 2019 to understand the spirit of God's law. And that can be another study. What is it? God is love. The spirit of God's law will draw you. Study that for yourself. Make that your motivation. Make that the drawing. Become like David who loved God's law because he understood its spirit. And remember, connectivity. May 2019 be a year of connectivity like you've never had before. Amen. And it will be a year of change like never before. May God bless you to this end is my wish and prayer.